So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the BIA Brexit webinar for April. Uh, it's Steve Bates, the CEO, and the other voice you'll hear is Laura Collister, our Brexit lead. Uh, Laura's done a great job here, already instantly resetting our Brexit countdown. This would have said only a couple of days ago, seven hours to go. And now, of course, it says 202 days to go until 31st of October. And if you're still counting, 629 days till the end of the transition. Um, we'll get through this. So I hope this uh, this month we've got uh, for you some um, where we're at today, um, this week's particularly the EU offer and the UK's response and what, what this is going to mean for the next few few weeks, particularly with regard to what does this mean for contingency planning, which is a question many people have been asking me uh, about. Uh, and then I think we're going to be slightly more discursive in the second half of our, uh, our webinar today about what we've learned from recent weeks, which may not be actually what we will plan for. And since we've done a lot of thinking around no deal um, and the run up to no deal, but it's useful to, and informative to, to understand what that might mean for the context of the next things that are coming up. Uh, these webinars monthly go on uh, onto our YouTube channel, and this is what we covered last time. Things have moved so fast, I, I imagine, unless you're uh, particularly interested in the, the heritage of, uh, uh, of, of Brexit, uh, it's the new stuff you have focused on at the moment. And of course, I always remind people that whatever's going on in Brexit, the BIA, the BIA is at the heart of a fantastic ecosystem. The UK sector remains vibrant and strong. Remember, the most money raised ever by the UK biotech sector was last year. Uh, we've got industrial strategy that is providing structure for future growth. We are the world's third global cluster for life sciences with fantastic work going on in cell and gene therapy, genomics, great science. I was out talking today about um, viral vectors and the rest of things uh, with a sizable uh, community, uh, 5,600 companies generating more than 30 billion in exports. So um, uh, whatever's going on in Brexit, the sector is going on and uh, please remember to tell this story around the world if you get the opportunity. Um, and uh, our lobbying position hasn't stayed, hasn't changed at all. For those of you who've joined this um, uh, monthly, you'll see this is a, uh, a hardy perennial like the red brick roofs of Coronation Street. Uh, it's uh, the same the same shot at the beginning of the show. Uh, our position remains the same on reg trade, movement of people, R&D and funding. So where are we today, which is probably what you're most interested in? Another old classic. Um, at the end of two years, negotiations can, can be extended further, but only if everyone agrees. Well, we, we saw that this week. We are having further negotiations about what might happen. Um, uh, in the middle of the week, uh, the EU27, the European Council, offered an extension to the UK, which the UK officially accepted. Um, uh, the UK government is preparing to hold uh, elections to the European Parliament, uh, although it doesn't really want to do it. Uh, and the implementation period uh, remains the same. Uh, these are the key documents. So it's interesting to me that the way that laws are made and uh, the key documents are are these ones. So this is the, the, the text on the left of the European Council, which came out uh, on the 11th, uh, only yesterday. And then a very short note from a man called Tim Barrow uh, to Donald Tusk, um, uh, accepting, writing to confirm the agreement of the government of the United Kingdom to the extension period under Article 50 brackets 3 to this decision are the key legal texts. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be with legal fellows who tell me that this is how international law is made and international law trumps national law. So whatever's gone on in Parliament, you only need to look at two documents. And the full text of the second one is on the right there. And the first one, uh, the European Council one, I'll go into some detail uh, here. This is the detail of the, the extension offer. Um, none of this should be news to you if you've read the newspapers, but um, uh, worth pointing to a few points here. So the European Council agrees to an extension to allow for the ratification of the withdrawal agreement. That's why such an extension lasts only as long as necessary and in any event no longer than the 31st of October 2019. So that's where the Halloween deadline day for uh, a six month extension comes from. If the withdrawal agreement is ratified by both parties before this date, the withdrawal will take place on the first day of the following month, and I'll take you through that in a subsequent slide. Importantly, and this is one that we see less in the papers, but uh, I think it's important to, to flag up. Uh, this is the. This also mentions that if the UK fails to live up to its obligation to hold elections to the European Parliament in accordance with law, the withdrawal will take place on the 1st of June. So we have in the legal text two dates, the 31st of October and the 1st of June. 
It also makes clear there can be no opening of the withdrawal agreement. So all of that discussion about whether there would be um, backstops to the backstop and such like in the withdrawal agreement won't happen. Um, but uh, if the UK position of the UK were to evolve, they could change the political declaration, which is the discussion document about the future shape of the future relationship. And I think interestingly and importantly, and we'll get into some detail here on the last second to last point, during the extension, the UK will remain a member state with full rights and obligations in accordance with Article 50. Uh, and the, the UK has the right to revoke its notification at any time. So um, it can, the UK can still uh, choose to revoke. So the, the, the legal text is important and that's why I've gone through it in some detail. Um, you can see also that there will be a, uh, a review of the, this in June on the 20th and 21st by the EU27 at their meeting on the 20th of June. Key text, gone through it in some detail. Hope you can see why I bothered to do it and I'll come back to this as we go through the webinar. So this means that we are going to have some European elections, we believe, in uh, the UK as a result of signing up to this, um, this uh, period of extension. And we've already seen lots of uh, interesting politics breaking out here. I'm going to have a crack at naming uh, Jacob Rees Mogg's sister, Anna Zutia. Laura, what do you reckon? If I got that one right? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have a crack at that one. Anyway, apparently um, uh, she is uh, standing as an MEP for Nigel Farage's new Brexit party. Uh, there's a picture here of uh, Boris Johnson's dad, who wants to stand for the Conservatives in the European elections, we're told. Um, Anna Soubry and the Independent Group are uh, inviting people to become candidates for the European election on their, their website. So uh, this is a, an unexpected but um, uh, an interesting uh, new development. Uh, today is the deadline in the southwest England for the publication of a notice to participate in the EU elections. Why do I care about this? This stuff has to happen, otherwise we crash out in, in, in June. So all of these things have got to happen. I don't know if that's happened. The reason why the southwest deadline is different, I believe, to other parts of the country is that it includes Gibraltar in the constituency for southwest England. And I believe that's the reason why the deadline has to be different. Uh, so we'll see the deadline for... Um, the publication of notice of participation uh, in the next couple of days in the rest of the UK. We have the small matter of some local elections in the UK on the 2nd of May, and there will be uh, elections on the 23rd of May, uh, which will be interesting if they go ahead, but it's important that they do go ahead for the, the withdrawal process. So this is uh, up, and, um, up and, uh, and upon us, and we shall watch with interest. And we've written, popped in the point here about Tajani warning that the EU election is not a game. Um, uh, because of the linkage it has back to that withdrawal agreement I put at the top of the uh, top of the webinar. So withdrawal agreement leads to elections is one part of it. The second part that I think we've seen breaking out today in, in news in the UK and I've taken some headlines here from various papers is that now that there is um, no longer going to be a no deal crash out to Brexit today, does this mean that the no deal plans can be stood down or are being stood down and civil servants are being ordered to stop doing things um, with immediate effect. So there's lots of that in the papers today. Um, Operation Yellow Hammer, as this is sometimes called in the civil contingencies place, uh, what's going on there? And I've put standing down question mark for a purpose because and this is important for our sector. So what is standing down and then what isn't? So what is standing down as best as I can establish it is they did have plans for civil servants to work 24-7 through this weekend, you know, making sure that as the crash out happened, computer systems were turned over, hotlines were op op operating. They're no longer needed because there's no crash out over this weekend. Border force were going to deploy to, to, to make sure that the, the new restrictions on immigration were going to be uh, ramped up. And that would have mean uh, quite a lot of work at borders. That doesn't need to happen because we're not crashing out this weekend and the environment department I'm told had a unit planned that was going to coordinate and ensure food supplies could get through again that's been stood down and of course everyone knows that parliament uh, having spent a lot of time uh, recently working on stuff uh, has gone into recess and is having a break for Easter I'm told MPs have rushed to get their uh, week away in so um, those things are, are standing down or are not not working at uh, full pace but, and this is the important piece, and this is new information, and this has come to people, I hope, this afternoon. This is a, an email from Steve Oldfield, who, as you know, is running the medicines contingency piece, the chief commercial officer in the Department of Health and Social Care. 
is writing to companies that have been involved in the work around medicines contingency. Uh, and I believe you should have got this email um, today, this letter by email from, from Steve. Uh, and I'll read you out um, the important uh, fourth paragraph from it. Uh, and I'll go through it slowly. He says, we will need to consider how best to how best to prepare for the scenario, the scenario of uh, that, that is um, the UK leaving under a no deal preparation on the 31st of October uh, and the impact on no deal preparations. We will work closely with industry trade bodies and other stakeholders to review the position carefully before sharing further guidance at the earliest opportunity. This is the important bit. In the meantime, all no deal measures brackets such as stockpiles, additional buffer stocks, etc. close brackets should remain in place but on hold until further guidance is available. He's extremely grateful for our excellent engagement and support over the last few months. I want to reassure you that I am committed to keeping you updated as this process unfolds. I'll do all I can to ensure you have the information you need to be able to plan properly. So the medicines contingency program, stockpiling, ferries, remains in place but on hold. We are seeking um, further engagement as to what this means, but uh, it is not being stood down. It remains in place, but on hold. So this is important and please make sure uh, colleagues are aware of this uh, and you should, should be getting this letter if you've been involved in the Medicines Contingency Supplier Programme. So this means that as a no deal Brexit is still a possibility, uh, the contingency planning programme continues. Remember our planning for this started many, many months ago. Um, uh, and is not formally uh, under the auspices of some of the stuff within Operation Yellow Hammer in the sense of the civil, being civil service uh, personnel operating against civil service uh, contingency plans. We're part of a broader contingency planning group and process, uh, and we're not being stood down uh, from that. Uh, they are going to engage with us as to what the ongoing ask will be and provide further clarity. And I think this is the important point you should be aware of from the BIA perspective. Um, we're aware of the challenge of maintaining a heightened state of readiness for companies uh, in this area. Um, you know, uh, we've been marched to the top of the mountain with uh, staring uh, a no deal Brexit down the barrel from two and a half days away before the deal was done on Wednesday. Um, that is not something being two and a half days away from a crash out no deal that we can we can maintain at any state of readiness. And we will need to engage on this. We want to know from government and I think it's great that Steve has written out to people and given them some clarity today but as we go back in what's their thinking how do we engage with them what's their planning assumptions what what what's changed what's going to happen with stock what's going to happen with ferries apologies I haven't got this in uh, line order dot and comma but you can see the the sense as to where both uh, we're thinking and I can think you can see where government's thinking the good news on this is that we already have scheduled a uh, a a the meeting a regular meeting which we call the EU um, RG the European Union Relationship Group meeting and that's the Thursday after Easter so not next Thursday but the Thursday after and I hope that that gives us enough time for government to be able to share new guidance with industry about what they hope us to be able to do we'll continue to highlight that you know staying at a very heightened state of readiness. Uh, is impossible for, for companies working cost of capital, all the rest of it. And we'll continue to ask questions and seek uh, gui new guidance, perhaps around what they want to do. So they want to continue the program. Obviously, uh, a six month delay uh, to no deal means it's less likely and certainly not imminent. But it doesn't mean that we can um, that we can stand down entirely. And, and as you know, uh, supply chains, we know all too well, aren't uh, eminently flexible. They've just taken a lot of work to get to this uh, and will take some some careful thinking and some some clear thought to, to get to this. But um, uh, I think uh, continues, but on hold. And uh, you can see that there's a, 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 a an early meeting where we hope we can get sensible thinking from 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 government uh, in the diary for a week on Thursday. I'll take you back to the references to uh, the withdrawal agreement and uh, sorry the the, uh, the the deal that was signed in the EU 27 and uh, the and the UK this week so one question I've been asked is when could no deal now happen what are the deadlines we've absolutely got to work against legally and of course the clear one is the October 31st deadline agreed in the new text from from Europe 
But of course, and as I mentioned before, there is a deadline of June the 1st also in that agreement, but that only happens if the UK doesn't comply with the European asks and doesn't hold the European elections. And I, I've rated that here as having a very small chance. But And therefore, what we're going to try and do uh, as we engage with government is seek to ensure that the June the 1st possibility is legally ruled out as part of clarity and certainty on the revised no deal planning assumptions. I can't guarantee that for you, but I think at the moment we look at that legal text and we see, OK, there is a chance of no deal on the 31st of October. There's text around a no deal on the 1st of June. Um, we can see planning for a European election happening, which we believe would, would mitigate that. But that's the legal position that uh, we're operating against. And I believe uh, you will be operating against and we'll try and get that June the 1st one. But that's also a reason why in thinking about contingency, we need to think about both of these as potential if improbable um, uh, deadlines. The other way to think about this is when could the UK leave the EU with a deal? And the reason I put May the 1st, June the 1st, July the 1st, August 1st, September the 1st, October the 1st or November the 1st or later is if you look at the text, it says that if a deal is done um, and a withdrawal agreement is, uh, is agreed and ratified through the UK Parliament, the UK could leave as soon as uh, the first date of the month that's the next month after the deal is done and ratified. So we also have a rolling series of, of deadlines for um, a deal dates over the next period of time. In some senses, this is less disruptive for, uh, as I understand it, for borders and uh, materials moving around because we go into the withdrawal agreement. Um, but it, it does have implications in our sector around, around regulation. And apologies, I've not had as much time as I'd like to to work up full implications of what this means. But uh, broadly, um, that's how I'm thinking about this. Remember, if there is a deal, um, it, could, it could move quite fast is the basic point here. June the 1st is also, you know, could either be deal or no deal deadline. And um, July the 1st is the last date the UK could leave without the MEPs that would have been elected in the end of May taking their seats in the Parliament. So both of these may become political deadlines against which the Prime Minister seeks to drive um, deals in Parliament or other things. Um, but we should be aware that's my, my planning assumption now. And I put November the 1st or later because one of the other things that could happen is it's not impossible to consider there being an extension on the extension because we've already had an extension on an extension. People said that wasn't going to happen, but now we've had it, we could see more of it. Apologies, this is a bit a bit like this today. It's not um, not entirely clear. Um, the, 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 the reason I've put this slide in about impact on regulation uh, is this point around the UK continuing to hold full membership rights during this period. And this is what the Prime Minister said in her statement to Parliament. The UK will continue to hold full membership rights, will continue to be bound by our, all our ongoing obligations as a member state, including the duty of sincere cooperation. And I, and I look at this and people can look at this and think about the role of um, the UK uh, in having European elections. Well, if we're going to continue to have participate in European elections, uh, there is a role now that we've had almost three years of continuing to participate fully in the medicines agency, its work, uh, uh, because from my perspective, it's a possibility now that this could go on for, for, for longer. So uh, I, I put this question here because I think it's something towards the posture that, that the BIA will be adopting around uh, around um, around how the UK as a, as, a, as a continuing as a member state should engage and uh, it might seem sort of counterfactual to think about this, but you know there is capacity um, uh, fraternity that that we can offer uh, and can continue we're continuing to pay for uh, without full engagement. And I think you know from our perspective as a life science industry, we'd like to see um, to see that um, honoured on both sides. And that's why I, I put it here. No more than that. This is a slide that you'll be familiar with uh, if you followed these uh, in the last couple of uh, couple of webinars been with us since December, hence the star. Is there going to be a deal? Is there going to be a no deal crash out? Is there going to be a delay or does Brexit not happen? Um, I think uh, the bits that have changed uh, are in, in red here. So we we said that there would be a delay uh, last time round. Uh, and that's actually, we, that, we guessed that in, the, in December, that's actually happened. There has been an extension for more talks. Um, there is talk of a second referendum. There's the possibility of a UK general election. I've added highly unlike, how highly to unlikely, highly unlikely to no deal crash out 
uh, in part because the UK Parliament did move to prevent no deal uh, and um, and also we saw that that was not something that the uh, Prime Minister was prepared to countenance nor was it something that the EU 27 were, were, were keen on or prepared to countenance so I've moved that into the category of highly unlikely. I've not moved the likelihood of a deal up much. Uh, I still feel, it still feels unlikely. There's still little progress on that. And who knows? Uh, I, I think it's unlikely that Brexit doesn't happen um, uh, because Article 50 hasn't been withdrawn. And there is no uh, no serious prospect at the moment of a of a second referendum at the moment. But um, remember, this is where we, where we keep it to. And my other favourite one from last year, um, any deal will be driven by a crisis. We've seen that 11th hour, 11th minute. Um, we've got um, a political class that doesn't understand in great detail the long lead time practicalities that we work to. And um, uh, and I think we we need to keep going on that with regard to particularly around the contingency programme. Parliament remains focused on other issues. And we've seen the, the vital importance of the rules of Parliament, Erskine May, rather than anything the Prime Minister wants to cook up. Uh, we've seen Parliament take back control. Uh, Parliament uh, reassert its authority over the government in some very innovative and interesting ways uh, if you are a constitutional historian. But um, this framing uh, has lasted nearly four months of Brexit discussion. So I'm, I'm quite delighted to see that that wasn't that, that wrong last Christmas. In the next few weeks, what's going to happen? Well, Parliament goes on recess until uh, 23rd of April. And for those of you who are uh, English, you'll be, you'll of course know that 23rd of April is not only St George's Day, but it is also William Shakespeare's birthday and the day that he died. And if you were ever to have a public holiday for England, my suggestion to you would be uh, to, to do it on April the 23rd and let's hope the weather's nice. Um, but uh, when they all come back from talking about that type of stuff, there will be Westminster political chaos uh, continued. Uh, we've already seen uh, the pressure on the Prime Minister from the Conservative uh, Brexiteers happening, you know, betrayal, all that sort of stuff. And no doubt we'll see that dynamic continue. And then the, the prime minister will come back and say, let's get going with a deal through parliament. We've got some time to do it. Let's have some calm heads and get go going on with it. That's not been proven to be that successful in the last few months. Um, I don't know whether the, the spring weather or the, uh, the the national day will change the mood, but um, but we'll find that out when, when we get to the other side of of Easter. And as always, uh, Laura's added a great slide here from the Daily Mail with some of the useful dates that are going on. So um, uh, thank you, Daily Mail. Um, if you think of it today and uh, in the next couple of days, the notice is for publication of participation in EU elections must happen. Then uh, St George's Day, the um, MPs return from their Easter break. There's the little matter of local elections in England and Northern Ireland. If you follow the track round with the grey dots, you'll then see 23rd EU elections in the UK and then of course the EU elections also happen everywhere else and that may change the tone of European discussion with the UK who knows um, uh, so uh, then possible the possible deadline of June the 1st in terms of a, a leaving date summit at the end of June towards progress June the 2nd the new EU Parliament sits nice break here from the Daily Mail in the summer for, uh, for, for, for August and in September you've got the political conference season happening and the deadline towards um, towards uh, the end of the year, Halloween for uh, the UK due to leave, uh, with or without, who knows, and we shall find out going forward. Laura, you've been um, doing a ton of work on this and keeping people informed. There's quite a few learnings that we've got from bits and bobs that have happened over the last few weeks. Why don't you take us through some of the bits that have happened and why they matter? Yeah, so um, I'll run through some of these reasonably quickly because they're whilst they are important they're not happening right now so the Cooper Letwin bill you would have seen this closely followed in the papers um, with the speaker having the having to tie um, having to cast a tie a vote to break the tie um, this was the um, fifth attempt at a EU withdrawal act to get the Prime Minister to um, extend article 50 and to make sure it happens um, this is important because it was the first time that something of this had got through in the indicative votes. Um, had None of them had um, made it through. This is the first one. By the time the bill had gone to the House of Lords, went back to the Commons, it was a w much wider, bigger majority that it was finally passed with. It shows that um, 
MPs from all sides are willing to move if it means um, avoiding a no deal Brexit. Um, moving on to um, a bit more about different parties. So obviously this has been in the papers. Um, Labour and Conservatives are looking to find some compromise and some common ground. This is where the Prime Minister is probably relying on to try and get the withdrawal agreement through by um, looking at the future political relation, future economic relationship with the EU. Um, they're ongoing um, and um, probably won't come back until we'll see what happens when Parliament's back um, on the 23rd of April, whether there's been any progress. One of the things that has been talked about um, in the papers is a possibility of a customs union. Um, so we sort of just have a quick slide. Um, a lot of what a customs union means for the sector depends on whether it's the customs union or a customs union of a sort. Um, it would help, one of our key priority asks has been around frequency trade at the borders, this would obviously help, but generally customs unions don't automatically include regulation, they also don't include services, which for some of our future technologies would likely be an issue. Um, uh, but um, depending on the outcome, they you do out some outside trade negotiations are able to happen. So it just depends whether it is a customs union or the customs union. Um, there was some discussion of this in Parliament, and Ken Clark um, has asked a few times in Parliament around um, regulatory cooperation and talked about the customs union. Um, this week um, he was saying he was talking about how there needs to be a customer arrangement and sufficient regulatory alignment to keep trade as open as free as possible. The Prime Minister um, in response said that the UK obviously wants to retain the benefits of the customs union um, and um, highlighted um, that the political declaration does talk about some cooperation um, did you want to add to this, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is where if we end up with um, discussions or, or if, 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 uh, if debates around uh, um, changes to the political declaration happen, we will watch these with great detail. There is lots that really matters to our sector. Um, you can see here that the Prime Minister doesn't mention the word regulation in her response to Ken Clark, and Ken Clark only asks for sufficient regulatory alignment, which is not the same in my book as um, full participation in a regulatory regime in terms of having a regulator that can um, input, engage, vote, provide scientific advice. Um, so there's lots of devil in the detail here uh, and it um, uh, we will continue to watch it very, very closely. The political declaration as it stands has certain asks in it, but um, the devil is in the detail and even to the extent that when questions are asked of this general nature, uh, sectors are very different in how they um, how they are regulated. Uh, our, our regulatory environment has a particular heritage, a particular set of things that are national competence, things that are done at an EU competence, things that were around under the Council of Europe, which is different from aviation, finance and other people. So we've really got to watch this in detail. And at the moment, there's not enough um, to engage with in the detail of this that will give us a sense as to whether uh, whether what's coming out of these discussions is sensible, useful, or, um, or, or or negative for our sector, or even what we can operate within. So just moving on, um, Theresa May has said that she will stand down if a deal is passed. Um, She's um, highlighted that there's um, desire for a new approach, and um, so her views that the second phase of the negotiations, so the future um, relationship with the EU, um, should be done by new leadership. Um, it was greeted um, well by MPs. Um, they are unable to hold a vote of no confidence until December of this year because they held one in December last year, which she won, and you can't do another one for a year. Um, and just to highlight there are two stages to the leadership process. First, the MPs select two candidates, and those MPs then go to the members for a one member, one vote. Um, um, round. Um, there have been um, an awful lot of cabinet putting their names forward. Um, obviously, some of the front runners and most popular at the moment are Gove, Johnson, Sly Javid, Matt Hancock, and Barad. There's lots of discussion about a possible dream team. Um, there's discussion around um, the MPs um, looking to select um, 
two candidates that they feel most comfortable with and doing deals around that. Um, so, but at the moment, there's no timing. It is within the prime minister's um, um, decision of when she stands down until there is a possibility of a no confidence um, towards the end of the year. One thing um, it might mean is that um, a new political, new conservative leader might mean we need to re, um, restate the case for medicines regulatory cooperation. Um, regulatory alignment is something that um, senior conservatives continually bring up um, externally, um, and I think we've seen comments recently from Michael Gove and um, in Parliament from Matt Hancock around is there some opportunity from regulatory divergence? Um, we probably don't need to start at the start of the need of regulatory cooperation, but we just need to make sure we keep pushing the benefits for patients, for public health, and for industry um, from this. I think, as you know, we've already run through the position, the position hasn't changed. Um, Moving on, um, and we're sort of just catching up on a few things which hopefully we may no longer need. Medicines regulation, if there is a no deal Brexit, um, we talked in the last few webinars about how MHRA needs to publish um, 80 documents. I looked at their website the other day or yesterday and I counted about 40 or so, so they're still coming. Um, we um, there we are highlighting them all on our BI Brexit website. Um, there is a regulatory um, page on that. It also includes EMA and European Commission um, guidance as well. Um, one of the things that we have heard from some people is that there are a few bugs in a few issues in some of the guidance documents that have come out. But equally, we also know that companies are really busy trying to read those documents and understand them all. Um, so we haven't pressed or pushed for what are the exact issues? Can you tell us about them? But when um, companies are ready and have some time, we would really um, welcome the opportunity if you could let us know what issues there are and provide some feedback to um, Christiane at the BIA. So, Laura, I think it, 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 just a, a comment from me on this. I mean, there's been a hell of a lot of uh, information coming out from uh, the MHRA already to run an entirely new regulatory system from uh, next week, essentially, was what they were planning towards. Uh, and I think they've done a tremendous, tremendous job uh, to get to where the, the, state, the, the, the state of information that is out there. As ever, this is now a piece of work that at least goes on the shelf, perhaps goes in a cupboard, and who knows whether it will end up finally going in the bin or not, we don't know. Or who knows, it at least goes in the cupboard and we may be bringing it out again uh, towards the end of May, towards the June deadline, or we may be bringing it out again in September towards an October deadline. Um, but uh, it's one of those really difficult ones. So it exists, it lives. Um, but uh, I've got to say, I shan't be, um, uh, be looking through this stuff over Easter unless I can't sleep. Um, but uh, I, will, I will be putting it to one side for a little while. I don't expect us to be focusing on it, but if you did have the if you have gone through it and there are any bugs you find, um, we, it may be useful to, to share them because we can see if, um, if people have, have also got queries. So not front and centre at the moment, but um, uh, it just shows the, 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 the challenge for us as a sector in operating against uh, wildly different outcomes uh, at, at a few days notice. The amount of work that's gone in and thinking that's gone in behind this, I, I know, but uh, in some respects, it's, it's stand down from the understanding of all the details of this, but um, it may be that it will come back very soon. And at least if it comes back in a few months time, we'll have had a chance to read it once and we'll be able to come bring it back, but yeah. So the last few webinars, we've had three slides when we got to this bit of what next if there's deal, what next if there's no deal, and what next if there's extension. So this time we have what's next, now there's an extension. Um, so just to bring a few things together, um, we're working with government, um, as Steve said out earlier, to understand the exact requirement of, um, of companies by government and to get some clarity on stock plan and contingency plans. We want to understand from them the timing and process and the delay um, and that it check that it's not moving no deal to a later date. What we're going to do is just carry on um, advocating our priorities of um, regulation, trade, people, R&D, cooperation and funding. 
Um, if a deal is passed, we want to be ready to um, get an early deal for medicines and patients in the future um, economic partnership. We also need to be ready in case there is a no deal and a bit of blame game. As you said before, um, we said we said don't do this and what's the evidence to do this? We are continuing to engage politicians across the spectrum and the officials who provide the continuity. And especially now there's um, the upcoming possibility of a conservative leadership campaign. And we're continuing our established um, governance structure with government. As Steve mentioned, we have an EU relationship group coming up. Um, one final um, slide in terms of this is what's been happening um, from the EU, um, another piece of no deal preparedness. The vice president um, gave a speech um, last week or um, in the last few weeks um, highlighting I'm um, focusing on health and food he talked about medicines he talked about medical devices he highlighted that if there is a no deal they have the rules um, for the appropriate procedures to ensure that medicines will reach patients in time and that treatment won't need to be interrupted they highlighted that industry needs to make the necessary arrangements in terms of medical devices um, they highlighted that they have um, basically given a lot of warning, but that if there are problems, member states have the possibility to use um, their local powers, um, to use existing re um, regulations to authorise a temporary place in the market of medical devices that have not been certified by an EU body. Um, this link below is where the full speech is, where you'll find more detail. Thank you. I think it's useful to highlight that because it does show that at the last minute there were some interesting moves from a, con from a considered position uh, by the Commission uh, who could see the, the challenges that uh, the no deal would, would lead to. Hopefully, again, this has gone away a bit, but it shows that there is last minute movement uh, when you see these things coming. In terms of the BIA, um, what are we doing? Well, we're going to bang on about um, <clears throat> what we need to do for the future of medicine supply at the EU relationship group uh, the Thursday after Easter. We'll continue to make the case for continuing regulatory cooperation, why medicine is different. Uh, uh, and uh, focus on both the EU and the new parliament uh, on one side, as well as conservative leadership candidates, and uh, be aware that uh, the Brexit debate may change if the Prime Minister chooses to go and there is a new lineup. Um, I think the other thing from my perspective is that we need to think about calibrating our work towards the more likely outcome. I think if you take the whole of the, the first quarter of this year, what it shows is that there isn't a majority in the House of Commons for a crash out, no deal Brexit, and the the both the UK government, the EU 27 have worked hard to avoid it, and it has been avoided. So that leads me to the impression, at the very least, that perhaps something softer uh, will emerge. Um, no guarantees on any of these things, but you know that's where we're calibrating towards. And I think, from my perspective, I touched on this: re-engaging with the EU 27 on the future of regulatory cooperation, science and innovation pact. Now that no deal seems less likely. If we're going to have a, uh, a future where we are uh, engaged in some format, why don't we start talking about that now? Why don't we work towards that from, from here on in? It seems sensible that, uh, to, to do that and that's one of the things that we'll, we'll do. I'm interested in BIA member voices on, on this point as well as we go forward and then we'll pay close attention what's going on in, in the UK Parliament and the Tory leadership campaign. Um, in terms of what we've been doing, uh, we've had a, we had a very useful uh, Brexit lead network uh, uh, earlier in the week. Uh, I hope you're continuing to find our newscast briefings and things like this useful. We keep talking to members of the parliament, we keep talking to ministers and we've putting everything together on our BIA Brexit website for you uh, and we keep going on uh, the implications of no deal, the medicine supply contingency planning program and the statutory instruments. Uh, I know that members are finding the BIA Brexit website I think we can call it a microsite anymore. It's not micro, really, is it? It's getting a little bit macro to be micro, but um, uh, it's certainly got a lot of stuff on it, and uh, I hope you're finding it useful for uh, whatever you need for your, your own internal purposes uh, going forward, and it remains our repository for this. So where are we? A disorderly no-deal Brexit in April has been ruled out. Um, I'm not uh, telling you today about emergency measures over the weekend, which is great. The Medicine Supply Contingency Programme planning program continues. It has not been wound down as a result of the step back from Operation Yellowhammer. It does continue and we will seek further clarity about exactly what that means. But it is 
please keep going with it is the ask from um, Steve Oldfield and the Department of Health and, Social, Health and Social Care. Please continue. And we are working with that to get more with government or clarity on uh, the Thursday after Easter. Of course, the sector remains brilliant and um, uh, we are working with the industrial strategy. Our policies are, are on Brexit remain what you asked us to do and we continue to do so. And we've got another one of these in the upcoming month of May. With that, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that many of you may have or typed in, comments or theories. Let's have a look. And you've got some questions for me. So we shall have a look. Uh, you've got, somebody's asking about the uh, impact on contingency plans for um, stockpiling um, uh, that was received right at the top of the, the hour. I hope we've been able to answer that as best we can from the Steve Oldfield letter. Um, uh, with regard to um, uh, implications for the MHRA being assigned rapporteurs, I don't know the answer to that. And it's the type of thing I will take to the ministerial meeting um, there. Uh, um, I hope we've been able to answer the, the, the thought as to whether the UK can will live up to its obligations and whether we will crash out on, on, on June the 1st. I, I, I see the government taking all the steps necessary to run European uh, elections, which I think are the main ones, and to act in a manner that is, uh, uh, that is with full, full obligations and, uh, and rights. You, you see it in the Prime Minister's statements to Parliament. You see it in um, things like the uh, provision of, uh, of polling cards and the sort of the, 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 the contingency work done by the Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster, who has responsibility in the Cabinet Office for the running of elections in the UK. So I think that they are doing all the things which um, which would show, uh, uh, which would lead you to believe that there's no reason to believe that there'll be a crash out on June the 1st. But until that is legally ruled out, we will continue to ask questions about that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think it is a very low probability, uh, but it can't be. Um, can't be absolutely ruled out, but it's still low, low uh, probability. Um, uh, somebody is asking around the uh, how can the UK continue with full rights given the MHRA is already uh, not already allowed to be a reference member state or a leading member state. Uh, I think the reason the rationale from this at the EMA was that the UK had signed Article 50 and therefore um, they had to prepare for operating as an EU 27 and that would mean they'd have to sail the ship without the UK in it, therefore they had to get ready for it. Um, and that was the basis on which the last couple of years planning they've operated under. I think it's, I would be surprised to see the European Medicines Agency change their, their view on the legality of this. Um, they will say, well, the UK is still seeking to leave the European Union, it's still got Article 50, um, what we merely have is an extension period to get the withdrawal agreement over the line. I think my my argument is one that's based in practicality, which is um, we've now seen a delay on a delay, an extension on an extension. We've now seen um, uh, no deal uh, crash out be ruled out by uh, the UK Parliament. We've now seen a further, uh, we've seen the political declaration of the UK government to seek continued regulatory cooperation in this area. We've seen developments from the EU side around um, the challenge that uh, no deal meant for certain types of regulation, particularly device regulation. Is it time to reset and to go for a more practical, uh, constructive engagement around this? I don't. Um, I don't expect that to be. Uh, I don't expect to be uh, welcomed into Amsterdam for uh, an immediate hug and a tea and coffee. But uh, but uh, I, I think it's worth putting the question as an industry now. Uh, uh, can the BIA make the government aware of issues around expiry data, uh, particularly for biotech medicines and the stockpile, well, so, stockpiling can't carry on in, indefinitely without impact on inventory levels and composition? Yes, we absolutely can and will. I've been making that point uh, from before the, uh, since really since the, the beginning of the week. We continue to make it. We can't hold you at the readiness levels. There are real practical implications for what's being asked. Um, and uh, and I'm confident that the the, cha the particular challenges of, uh, of maintaining stockpiles are understood by expert civil servants and NHS staff we are, who we interact with. But we do need um, 
speedy clarity on uh, their continued thoughts on this and the thoughts on this are related to the deadlines which I hope I've set out today and why there's this complexity of the June the 1st date as well as October 31st and um, and I have not yet got my head round um, what we can do in terms of being the grand old Duke of York in three month or a six month deadline you know if we're going to march to the top of the hill march back down again march up again march down again what is practical and I'd rather get it right um, than um, but then, then, then flip flop, and I hope I'm hoping that we'll get some clarity and some clarity that works for for companies. I realise the goodwill that's been asked of companies to do this stuff um, uh, in the the meeting after Easter. Are the MHRA continuing to work on the documents that they said that they were going to deliver in case of hard Brexit? Um, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I hope that. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm uh, I think that's one that for me is one I've not asked the MHRA directly about with regard to whether they are deprioritizing some of the work uh, as part of it being uh, sort of stepped down from let's get ready for no deal tomorrow. My sense is that they will continue to try and get themselves ready, but um, it's a good question I've not asked. Um, and remember before they were doing all this work, we said we, we, we thought you'd do really well to get it done by the deadline they were operating to, which was last month they didn't get there by the deadline they said they were going to do they're probably nearer it now than they were but um i don't know where it sits in their priority stack they will be at the ministerial meeting and i shall i shall ask them on it at um uh, at the erg meeting um what's their plan is their plan to continue to complete the process that they had already established or are they reprioritizing is their reprioritization um given different timelines i, I don't know it's a good question <clears throat> Question on Cooper Letwin bill. Does it give the MPs the one off power to force the, MP, the PM to extend Article 50 or is it continuous power? Can they force any PM to extend Article 50 beyond October? Yeah, it was one off because they put the date in, didn't they? We think it's one off. We will look at that and if it's um, got um, some capability for when it might come back, we'll put it in the next webinar, um, I think. Um, even though we have an extension of Article 50 to October 31st, presumably this leads into the extended transition period to December 2020. Um, yes, so um, the the transition period or the, the, the out date of December 2020 is not changed by the um, extension of the period uh, to ratify the withdrawal agreement. So in a sense, the the transition period has been eaten into by them not doing the withdrawal deal. Uh, and although they could choose to extend the period beyond 2020 at the moment, that's not in the, the text at the moment. The, this is simply a, an extension of the period of time for the UK to, um, if you like, agree the withdrawal mechanism and then go into what would then be a shorter period to agree the future future state. Um, that's, that's the thinking at the moment. There hasn't been an extension to the uh, tran to the transition period. I think that's most of the the questions. I'm conscious that we've kept you here till ten to five on a on a, on, a, on a Friday before uh, what I hope some of you will have as a as the start of an Easter break. Um, uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, thank you very much to to Laura for uh, an immense amount of work. Thank you very much to BIA members for engaging. Um, we'll be back with more uh, on this. Um, in uh, coming weeks uh, as I say uh, our next webinar will be on May the 12th we've a range of exciting events for you across June and July if you want to uh, meet uh, other people in our sector or uh, engage on some of the other interesting things we've got the um, next lead lead network is July the 23rd uh, and uh, uh, oh, I've got the wrong date here haven't I I've got I've the, put the wrong date in um, it's Thursday the 16th is the next. Thursday 16th of May at 4 o'clock is our next webinar. With that, many thanks and I um, uh, hope you have a good break if you're getting some time at Easter. Thank you.